Welcome to my second try at getting this under 15 minutes. This is Archetypal and Biblical Criticism, where we deal with archetypes and biblical illusions. Um, I need to go faster this time. I have a timer going. Let's go. Archetypal Criticism is based on the work of Carl Jung, who was a psychologist, and you can see there in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, who was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud and who had an idea that he called the collective unconscious. Now, what the collective unconscious is, and it sort of is the underpinning of archetypal criticism, so it's important, um, what, he, what he felt uh, that it was, was a, was, was a sort of a collection of knowledge and um, ideas and symbols that we as humans are naturally and automatically connected to. So we can access these things just based on the fact that we are human beings. So if we focus, narrow our focus slightly to literature, this means that there are certain characters and story patterns and symbols that are, are common across cultures, across languages, um, and across, across all literature. So that is why he felt that... Um, that is the reason, sort of, that his 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 explanation for the fact that uh, that literature has these patterns that repeat across languages and cultures was this collective unconscious idea. Okay, so as human beings, we're, we're born sharing some fundamental ideas, and whenever we see those things, and again, if we if we talk about literature, whenever we see those images or characters or story patterns, then we connect to them. But it's important to mention that we don't know that we're connecting with them. It happens unconsciously. So if you remember back to Freud, the conscious level is everything we're aware of, and but there's things that happen subconsciously or unconsciously, and we're not aware of those. So Carl Jung felt that we, we connected to these things um, on an unconscious level. Uh, he wasn't the only one to, to propose this sort of idea. There's other uh, philosophical ideas, uh, like the Oversoul and the Platonic Ideal. If you want to look into those, you're more than welcome to that uh, sort of espouse the same kind of thing. Okay, lovely statue there. Uh, along those lines, the first, um, first person and the first thing we'll deal with in archetypes is Joseph Campbell's monomyths. So Joseph Campbell, uh, if you're in my class in grade 9, we did the hero's journey. This is a simplified version of the hero's journey. That has 12 stages or something, and you can boil it down to essentially three. So Joseph Campbell identified that oftentimes in myths, there is three stages. There's a separation departure where the hero leaves his or her sort of safe place, home, childhood, uh, village, whatever, and leaves, <clears throat> excuse me, and leaves and goes off to complete some sort of task or quest. And in doing that, the hero encounters friends, enemies, obstacles, uh, almost dies, um, and then is ultimately victorious or successful in his or her quest. And after that, they come back and share what they have learned. They come back as a, as a new person, as a hero, and share what they've learned and gained with um, everyone that they left in the first stage. Okay, so that's, that's Joseph Campbell's monomyth. It's an example of an archetypal story pattern. There's another, care, uh, sorry, another critic named Northrop Fry who identified um, story patterns as well. It's, it's kind of similar to uh, Campbell's work, but, but slightly different. And he named them, excuse me, he named them after the, after the seasons uh, or the, type, or the uh, time of day. So we've got dawn or spring, which deals with those things there. Bildungsroman is a German term that means a growth novel. It's a story of growing up. We have zenith or summer. And we have sunset and autumn. And night or winter. So in order to save some time, cut some time here, you can go through those things on your own. Uh, you can notice that they're, the modes are kind of the, the tones of the story. So dark, uh, dark stories would be sunset or autumn or winter. Uh, and then happy sort of, um, you know, rom romance or comedies are, are usually dawn, spring or zenith and summer. Okay, quickly, archetypal characters. We've got 10 minutes left here. Archetypal characters. Uh, that you are usually female, so these are characters that again occur across literature, across cultures. That's why it meant. so it makes them archetypes. We have the virgin or bride, which we've discussed. If the female character is slightly older, there's a good chance that it is a mother character. 
is a mother to the hero or is it a, is, is a she is a mother to something also, we have the siren or whore uh, archetypal character. A siren is a term that means a, a beautiful, alluring uh, woman who often sort of um, distracts uh, a male hero. Um, see cruelty and temptation there. Should be a comma in between cruelty and temptation. Anyway, and lastly, something we've talked about before as well, we've got the old woman character, the hag, the crone, or the witch, um, who generally has sort of mysterious qualities to her. Okay, archetypal characters that are male. We have the unlikely hero, usually a young boy, a small, physically small, unassuming, uh, shy, wimpy boy uh, who has not discovered his secret powers or depths just yet. Um, the obvious one that's coming to mind is Harry Potter here, but there are many, many others. Usually the protagonist of the story, the hero of the story. Uh, we also have his unlikely, uh, sorry, his loyal friend or companion, the sidekick, if you will, Robin to Batman, uh, whatever Harry Potter's friend is to Harry, uh, Ron, is his name Ron? I don't know, I've never read the books or seen the movies, uh, but nonetheless is, is completely uh, loyal to the hero, uh, to the death if necessary. We've got the father, king, or god character, and... Um, Generally, that character is is sort of as the as the name implies is kind of a ruler, uh, is powerful, um, and I, I'm sure there's one in Harry Potter, but I don't know it well enough. Uh, for sure, there's an old man slash wizard slash advisor in Harry Potter. Uh, it's named Dumbledore, I think. I don't know why am I asking these questions. Not sure. Anyway, uh, just like the the um, the witch or the crone for female is usually. Um, sort of, uh, you know, mysterious or magical. And we have the warrior, who is the skilled fighter who fights for the good guys, uh, generally uh, for the king, and often uh, is tragically to, uh, cut down in battle, you know, in service to the hero. Okay, archetypal characters that are not associated with either uh, gender. We have the uh, villain, the bad guy. The bad girl, the pro, the antagonist, is the character who uh, against whom the hero battles. Uh, the care it's the character that is in the way of the hero achieving his or her goal or objective. Uh, it's in almost every single story. If you don't have a conflict, you don't have a story. We've got the traitor. Um, starts off the story seemingly loyal to the hero, but then uh, betrays the hero. We have the Cassandra or prophet or seer, which is usually a usually an older um, an older man, I would say, but I've got it in, in general gender neutral here, who uh, tries to make a warning, tries to warn characters or heroes about things that are going to happen in the future, is often ignored, passed off as crazy, but is often correct. And lastly, we've got the scapegoat uh, who who gives up his or her life um, for other people to be able to live. So those are gender neutral archetypal characters. Archetypal story arcs and themes. We have several here. The initiation or the loss of innocence. So that is, um, you know, somebody growing up, a character growing up or a character uh, realizing something that they didn't know before and having their sort of innocence ruined. We have sacrificial stories. Uh, those are fairly uh, straightforward. We have resurrection stories. Doesn't have to be a literal Christ-like resurrection. We'll talk about Christ in a second. We have great marriage stories where usually romantic comedies uh, going back to, and probably before, but Shakespeare had a lot of comedy uh, plays. They always ended with a wedding. Uh, we have overcoming or embracing the shadow. That's often dealing with inner turmoil, uh, sometimes, pro sometimes portrayed you know, uh, explicitly as as um as another person i'm thinking of of spider-man and evil black spider-man whose name is venom i believe as a good example of that and the heroic quest we already talked about that joseph campbell and the hero leaving his or her uh his or her safe place to to go on a quest and then come back okay biblical symbolism very quickly i'm not an expert 
I am I uh, don't mean to pass myself off as one here and if your if your biblical knowledge is is good and strong then uh, this is a good uh, criticism for you to do if it's not it's probably not the best uh, the best one to do but nonetheless um, it's can't the reason it's it's it can't be included in archetypal criticism is because it's not quite universal it's very common very popular in across the world but there are still uh, if there are still a great many people in the world who do not practice Christianity uh, and so for that reason we can't really consider it archetypal Okay, so to do this, you need to look for allusions or references to biblical stories or figures. There's some listed here. Job, who was persecuted for a long time. Jonah, who was swallowed by the whale. Uh, Noah, who uh, listened to God uh, when God told him to do something weird. Uh, then we've got the apostles, Judas, Thomas, Peter, and Paul. Those, If you'll notice, those apostles, Judas, has become synonymous with betrayal. And a doubting Thomas is a, is a famous, not a famous, but a common expression for someone who is, is skeptical. Um, so those apostles uh, have become pretty much synonymous with, um, with those emotions. Okay, uh, tomorrow is Good Friday, so uh, this is very appropriate. Christ, uh, all of the sort of um, different aspects of Christ's story uh, are, are, are well reflected in English literature. So, you know, the things he did during his life, his crucifixion, his resurrection, the Christmas story, uh, walking on water, the loaves and fishes story, all of these ones here, I don't need, you can read them uh, for yourself. Um, even sort of his aphorisms, his, 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 his maxims or his advice, for example, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, those things are, would be very uh, commonly reflected in, in English literature. Okay. I've got two minutes and 53 seconds left. I've done well here. So your, your task for today is to look at the lottery, you thinking about archetypes and sort of using archetypal criticism. So uh, with the extra sort of added wrinkle that I would like you to try to find quotations this time uh, and jot them down, that would prove if you were to be writing an essay on this, you could, you're, you're going to try to find quotations that would help you Prove your point that um, that there are, there are many archetypes uh, in the story, the lottery. Okay, uh, I hope you this finds you well. Uh, I've got two minutes and ten seconds left here with which to blather, but I don't think I'll use up all that time. So um, <clears throat> tomorrow is I mentioned Good Friday and Monday. Those are both holidays. I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to be giving you work or not. I probably won't, but just I will. I will let you know either way uh, on Slack probably later today. So uh, signing off for now. I will talk to you soon.